So just to review really quickly, last time we looked at the difference between achiral and chiral molecules and how to identify achiral molecules by looking for a plane of symmetry in the molecule. So for instance, a typical achiral molecule is a lot of what you're used to seeing in terms of the basic hydrocarbons, right? So we would look at a molecule like butane, which is shown here, the ends being CH3 groups here, and those two intervening carbons being CH2 groups, and we would see that this molecule possesses a plane of symmetry, and it's simply the plane of the board there. We can reflect the groups through the plane, and we would get the same molecule out. Any molecule possessing a plane of symmetry or an inversion center, which we discussed last time as well, we can identify as achiral. That is, it's identical to its mirror image. So it sort of doesn't possess these interesting properties that we've seen of chirality and, uh, and optical activity associated with chirality. Uh, along those same lines, light can be chiral. And in fact, I think light is the most convenient chiral object that organic chemists can access. So light is ordinarily thought of as a plain polarized ray, right? But we can imagine light being composed of two circularly polarized beams rotating in opposite directions. And because each of the beams is chiral, the interaction of a chiral molecule in non racemic form is different with the right-hand helix and the left-hand helix. The result, as a material passes through as light passes through a chiral material, is the plane of the light is rotated. So light coming in might have a plane like this. On the way out, it might be rotated to this angle. And that angle of rotation is a characteristic of the material as long as we take other variables into account. In looking at the naming of stereoisomers and how to distinguish them in terms of nomenclature, we use the RS system for asymmetric carbons, or stereocenters. We'll look at a system today that deals with double bonds and how to distinguish diastereomers of double bonds called the EZ naming system. Both are designed around the idea that we need to assign priorities to the groups around an asymmetric center or region and then in some absolute frame of reference identify the positions of the groups based on their priorities. So this is how the RS system works and you'll see this is kind of how the EZ system works as well. Last time we also identified a relation between the configurational difference between two molecules with the same connectivity and their stereoisomeric relationship. So for instance, we noted that enantiomers differ in configuration at every single stereocenter. So what that means is that for a molecule that is, for instance, possesses the R configuration at all of its centers, the enantiomer of that molecule would possess the S configuration at all of those centers. Diastereomers, on the other hand, differ in configuration at at least one, but not all of their stereoisomers. So what this means is that typical diastereomers, for instance, if one diastereomer we identified as the R SS diastereomer, the RSR stereoisomer of that molecule with the same connectivity would be a diastereomer. So those two are related as diastereomers. Whoops. <laughs> right, so taking a look here, the RSS and RSR molecules would be related as diastereomers. Apologize for that. So kind of getting the hang of things here. All right, so what are we going to be dealing with today? Today we'll be looking at, first of all, double bond isomerism. So first of all, we're going to take a look at the EZ system that's used for double bond nomenclature. So you can see here on this slide that double bonds can exist in one of two isomeric forms. And remember, these are diastereomers because we actually observe um, different distances between groups in the molecule. So for instance, take this top example, which is a substituted styrene. We have a methyl group here and a methyl group here. We see those methyl groups are quite far apart. On the other hand, in this, this other diastereomer, in which the positions of the H and the CH3 have been switched on the end here, we see that the two methyl groups are much closer together. And this has oftentimes a small but important effect 
on the reactivity of these two isomers. For instance, we would expect the hydrogenation of the more substitute of the more unstable, excuse me, cis isomer to be much more easy than hydrogenation of the more stable trans isomer. The way we assign the easy designation is first of all by performing a procedure similar to what we performed last time in terms of assigning priorities. So we first assign priorities by atomic number, and then if we see the same atomic number on both groups, we look for the first point of difference between the groups in order to assign a priority. So for instance, we start on the left-hand carbon here of the double bond. To assign the priorities of these two groups, we would note that we treat this carbon here we see two carbons, and so we need to go to the next layer, so to speak. We see this carbon on the left here is essentially attached to four other carbons. We treat the double bond as two single bonds to carbons, and then that third bond is attached to a carbon as well. On the other hand, the CH3 is, of course, attached to three hydrogens. Because carbon is greater in atomic number than hydrogen, and we have more atoms of greater atomic number on the bottom center, we would assign a higher priority to that bottom center. So we would give, for instance, that bottom center a priority of one and the other methyl group a priority of two. Going to the other side, we only have to look at the atomic number. So the hydrogen has a lower atomic number than carbon, so we would assign a two there and a one here. What we see here is that the two groups that are on that are of higher priority are on the same side of the double bond. And so I've actually mistakenly labeled this as E. This should be labeled as the Z isomer. The typical way I remember this and the way I learned it is Z, Zame, Zai, right? So the two groups of higher priority are on the same side of the double bond. That's how we know it's the Z isomer. Coming over here, we see that the two groups of higher priority, which I've circled here, are now on opposite sides of the double bond. And so we call this the E isomer. Apologize for the confusion there. Moving on now down below, looking at this, we have two hydrogens that we can sort of use as reference points. So clearly these will be the lower priority groups. And so looking at the methyl group and the furanyl group, just to kind of clear everything out here, the methyl group and the furanyl group will clearly be our groups of higher priority. And so we would call this the E or the trans isomer. You'll notice a perfect correspondence between the term trans and the term E. However, trans only applies to one, two disubstituted double bonds. For instance, in this case, we see we have a one, two disubstituted double bond with two hydrogens attached in this sort of fashion. On the other hand, switching the methyl group and the hydrogen here, we then generate the Z diastereomer, where the methyl group and the furanyl group are much closer together. I'll invite you to try this last example on your own. It's an interesting look, I think, at the um, priority system and how we use it. And rest assured that I've taken a careful look at that example, and it is most certainly correct. So take a look at that if you're interested in really learning more about the priority system and how it works.